What's up, guys? Welcome back to the channel. This is John Kelly here to break down Dana White Contender Series Week 3. Coming off a rough week last week, it was not great. You know, Week 1, for those that, ha that have just started recently watching my stuff, Week 1, we crushed, we swept everything, feeling great, riding high, feeling confident. Come back in Week 2, and bam! Reality check. So basically got everything wrong uh, last week. I'll actually go ahead and pull up the results real quick. So obviously wasn't great. Ended up losing both my individual bets. Obviously we had M Muan Gafarov, who I thought looked a lot better on his regional tape. For some reason, cardio seemed to be a major issue for him. I still think the matchup stylistically was really in his favor. We saw him have a ton of success with the wrestling. It really just, the striking didn't look as good as it did previously, but I think it was mainly a cardio issue. We saw late in that fight, especially like the optics just didn't look great. Shout out to those that got Chad and Hellinger. It was a split decision. You, you got a big price on him. So shout out to you guys if you cashed on a big underdog ticket there. I, I don't think that's the last we'll see of Gafarov. You know, I do think he has a good skill set. It just wasn't a good showing. Again, I really think it was the cardio. But overall, you know, obviously if our guy's not going to have the cardio to go a hard 15 minutes, then we probably don't want to want to lay minus 225, even though we beat that closing line by quite a bit. So so lost that one there. Um, and then obviously the Mario Souza fight, that was just a bad read on my part. You know, I thought Souza was going to be a more dangerous striker. I thought he'd have better cardio as well. And it was kind of a funky fight. I thought Chitty and Jukawani would have had a cardio issue, but it kind of didn't really play out that way. Maybe it was because he had those extra breaks because Souza kept kicking him below the belt. So he got two long breaks. You saw him huffing and puffing early, but then over the course of the fight, you know, it was actually Mario Souza. All that body work, those knees knees in the clinch that ended up doing damage to him where his cardio ended up failing him so he basically got beat in every area of that fight so that one was just a bad read on my part so yeah not great lost my two individual bets lost the dgen parlay but we're looking to get back on the right track for week three and there's a couple good spots that i like this week so i think we can do that so let's get right into it so first fight up we have nasruddin nasruddinov going up against jalton almeida this one's at light heavyweight to get things started nasruddinov is an undefeated prospect he's got good wrestling he's more of a control grappler he's fought some decent competition over in aca including wins over Corey hendricks who recently fought in pfl uh win over jorge gonzalez who's a current ufc level fighter he's a little bit undersized at light heavyweight he's fought at middleweight in the past i wouldn't be surprised if he does reach the ufc if we see him drop back down to the middleweight division uh, but in that gonzalez fight you know there was definitely some things I, I i took away from that that i liked he took down gonzalez three times in that fight ended up finishing him with ground and pound he was the only person to this day that's been able to win by ko against Jorge Gonzalez, who's historically pretty durable. It's usually the grappling, the defensive grappling that Gonzalez struggles with. Um, but I thought he looked pretty good in that fight. He's got some good leg kicks. You know, the striking could be could be better. Um, he's more of a, a onesie twosie striker. He tends to not be as aggressive as he should be at times. But like I said, he's got some good leg kicks decent overhand right he looks for that uppercut punch quite a bit um, but again he just needs to let his hands go and throw in more combinations outside of just when he thinks his opponents hurt but overall he's a decent prospect the ground game is really where he shines with that control grappling and it's going to be put to the test here against Jalton Almeida couldn't really find a lot of tape on this guy but he, he's definitely more of a grappler maybe even a one-dimensional grappler hey he hasn't really fought anybody on the regional scene eight of his 13 wins have come by submission he does have a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He trains with Carlos Felipe out in Brazil, and he's cornered him in the past as well. But he's only been out of the first round in four of his 15 fights. And Nasrudanov, on the flip side, you know, cardio isn't really a strong suit for him. But even in previous fights, when we saw him get tired, he was able to go to the wrestling. So I would actually favor Nasrudanov if the fight gets extended. I think this is one where it's probably lined about right. Currently, Nasrudanov minus 190 to come back on Almeida's plus 160 like I said I think that's about right I don't have a play on it I think Nasser Donov is the clear better minute winner so if you got on him early at the opener at minus 155 I think that was a good bet but currently I just don't think it's worth playing on either side if Almeida if this line starts to move and we see Almeida at plus 200 or higher, then I have interest in taking a shot on the underdog because he is, there. there's a lot of unknown variables where he could have leveled up since the last time we've seen him. And again, there hasn't been a ton of tape on him, but also just plus 200 against 
a guy that, like I said, is an okay prospect outside of his controlled grappling. He really can be hit on the feet as well. And Almeida has the uh, the high level black belt. So plus 200 or, or higher, I'd take a shot on the underdog here. But in terms of the D-Gen parlay, we're going to go with Nasser Donoff. Just a better minute winner. I think he gets the job done. I think he stays safe on top and uh, gets the job done here in this light heavyweight bout. Next fight up in the bantamweight division, we have Brandon Lewis going up against Mo Miller. And this is the fight that I have circled on the card because this is going to be super, super fun. Brandon Lewis... Uh, for those that don't know, basically he, he's been fighting since he was like 15 years old. Even before that, he was comes from a high-level karate background. But he, he started his amateur career at 15 years old, fighting pretty much his entire life, and ended up getting a serious injury, slipped a disc in his back, uh, which ended up getting like some sort of nerve issue as well. He was out of the sport for four years, came back, won a split decision in LFA, former karate champion, black belt in karate and taekwondo. And you see that in his striking. He'll throw some spinning wheel kicks. He's got some pretty sharp boxing as well. He just gets hit too much you know his his striking is good offensively but that's all he's worried about is is landing those big shots and he's just eating shots left and right which obviously isn't great you know he went kind of life or death with Jimmy Meza over in LFA, who's not really anybody. So that's a little bit concerning. And in that fight, shout out to Laura Sanko, a direct quote. She said, Brandon Lewis also has a black belt in aggression. And that really sums up the way he fights because he's going to move forward. And like I said, he's going to look to land big shots. He doesn't necessarily care if he has to eat some big shots doing that. So I just expect him to try to move forward, be a high paced fight. Mo Miller is legit. He comes from, he, he's had a couple of fights over in LFA as well. He comes from a high level wrestling background, division two, all American wrestler. And now he trains with Stipe Miocic and Alexa Kamer at strong style MMA. He's an explosive wrestler with good technique and just so, so strong. I mean, I can't overestimate how physically strong he is with that wrestling, combining that with the, the high High level technique and he is a problem for this division his striking's been improving he comes from a taekwondo background as well he's got some decent kicks but again i just go back to the power style wrestling uh won a fight a couple fights ago where he just slammed his opponent on his head and knocked him out um the takedowns are are non-stop you know once he wraps his hands it's like impossible to peel this guy off of you he was actually supposed to compete on the Ultimate Fighter this season, but tested positive for COVID, I have zero doubt he would have won that entire show by a country mile. That's how good his wrestling is. So even though I like Lewis, I think Lewis can make it a dog and make this a high-paced, fun fight. It's just that this is a really difficult matchup for him against such a good wrestler like Miller. I expect Miller to wrap his hands, to close the distance, and, and I just really struggle to see Lewis be able to pull him off uh, for the duration of this fight, or at least long enough to land something heavy on the feet. So it's going to be a war. It's going to be high paced, but I really expect Miller to be the more dominant fighter in this fight. So I like Mo Miller. Too big of a favorite, unfortunately, to bet at minus 290. The comeback on Lewis is plus 230. I don't hate the dog shot, but again, I just keep going back to the high level wrestling of Miller. I think he gets the job done here. So I'm going to go with Mo Miller, the Mo Show for the D-Gen Parlay. Up next in the middleweight division, we have Albert Duryov going up against Kyo Bittencourt. And this one is interesting because on one hand, we have Duryov, who's been knocked out three times in his career. But over the past six years, he's on an eight-fight win streak. So we really haven't seen his durability tested much recently outside of getting rocked once or twice in some of his recent fights. But he used to fight at welterweight. He's the former double champ over an ACB at welterweight and middleweight. He's kind of got an interesting striking style. His striking is decent, but he's super heavy on his lead leg. Solid leg kicks. He's got a decent jab as well. Eight of his 13 wins have come by submission, though. He's another guy who, when he goes to the grappling, he's a very controlled grappler. Position over submission. And then if if it materializes, then he'll take the sub. So he's a decent grappler. But he's going up against Kai Bittencourt. And this one, there's so many variables in this one because there's a lot of unknowns. You know, both of these guys are coming off a three-year layoff. So right away, there's huge question marks on both sides, what these guys are going to look like now, three years later. But Bittencourt, I expect him to be the one that actually looks a little bit better since the last time we saw him. You know, he's got some powerful, sharp leg kicks. He's on an eight-fight win streak. 12 of his 14 wins have come by knockout. And in a fight that I just expect to be very high-paced, lot of variables here this is a high variance fight 
couple of big boys. Both of them have power, but I think Duryev has a hard time covering a minus 400 price tag in a high variance fight where I think both guys are capable of finding a finish. So again, there's a lot of question marks on both sides here, but this is just a huge price to lay for a guy that I have some serious questions about. So I actually like taking the shot on Bittencourt. I like what I've seen from him in the past. You know, he's not super high level, hasn't fought really anybody. So this could be the toughest test he's he's yet to face. But again, I just keep going back to the price and I have a hard time seeing Duryov cover a minus 400 price tag unless he immediately goes to the grappling and finishes on the mat instantly. So I like taking the small shot on the underdog in Bittencourt at plus 300. That's going to be a bet for me, and we're actually going to go with him for the DJ and Parlay. First two fights, we went with the favorites. We're going with a big underdog in fight number three in Bittencourt for the DJ and Parlay. Up next in the heavyweight division, this one I actually broke down back in week one. These guys were supposed to fight. We have Lucas Brzezeski going up against Dylan Potter. This one's at heavyweight, and I actually like Potter a little bit more than I did last time. My biggest concern with him is that he was taking the fight on like five days notice, but because the fight got bumped, now he's had more time to prepare rather than just moving up to heavyweight from light heavyweight on just a few days notice. But Potter's been knocked out a couple times at light heavyweight, so we'll see if he can take the damage at the next level. But, you know, going back to what I said back in week one, Potter's just more well-rounded. He's a much more technical striker, should have a volume edge, and I think he has a cardio edge as well. Where I have concerns with Potter is, again, the size. He's probably a more natural light heavyweight than heavyweight, and he does get stuck on his back at times if he's taken down, but I'm not really expecting Brzezeski to wrestle much. He's mostly a typical power puncher, and he's he's fought extremely low-level competition. I just think he's he's fraudulent, and to see him at a big price tag, I think this is another dog or pass spot. I'm going to go with the guy who's more experienced, more well-rounded, and a better technical striker in Dylan Potter. So this is another one. I'm going to take the dog shot in the plus 225 range, and we're going to go with Dylan Potter for the D-Gen parlay. Up next in the welterweight division, we have Anhe Luis going up against Jack Della. Luis is extremely, extremely powerful striker. He's got fast hands and a deadly one-two combination. He's ultra aggressive, especially early on in his career. He would just like rage move forward and just swing heavies until he dropped his opponent. And most of the time that worked out for him. Uh, but obviously you want to see a more patient a more technical approach once you start to level up and face some better competition and I think he's done that even in his last fight he, he started to look a little bit more patient but he, he's just extremely powerful it's mostly the hands that you have to worry about with him five of his seven wins have come by knockout but he's been training with Henry Hooft at Sanford MMA for the past two years and I really think we see a really good product here from Anhe Luis. The power was impressive to me even when he was raw early on, early on in the regional scene, but now seeing a more balanced approach, a more technical approach with one of the better striking coaches in MMA coming off a two-year layoff where he's done nothing but improve. I just think we see a really powerful striker in Ange Luis and I think Jack Della is going to have his hands full and Jack Della is on a nine fight win streak himself he's the welterweight champ over an eternal MMA which is the regional scene in Australia there's a lot of regional scenes that we sort of rank as higher level than others Australia probably pretty low you know shout out to Australia not a hater but yeah the regional scene for MMA is is not great there uh, eight of his nine wins have come by knockout he's a decent boxer he does have some really powerful hooks but he he gets hit way too much to cover a favorite price tag here especially against a guy who's as powerful and as dangerous as on hey Luis so Luis at plus money is a bet for me. And, and we're going to go with another dog here. I, again, I just think he's the more technical striker, the more dangerous striker in a fight where I think both guys are going to get hit. I trust him to land the harder shots. And Jack Della, even on the low level regional scene, you know, going back watching his fights, you hear the announcers, Jack Della typically needs to get hit once or twice to wake up and get going. Like that's not something you want to hear from a guy who's priced as a favorite going up against probably the toughest test he's yet to face in Angel Luis in terms of how dangerous he is. So again, Luis at plus money. I think he could even close as a small favorite come Tuesday. We'll see. But yeah, I like the bet there. That is my most confident play on the card. So we're going to go with another underdog in Angel Luis. Wrapping things up in the women's flyweight division, we have Jasmine Jusadevichis going up against Julia Polastri. That's a mouthful. Jasuda Vicious, 
lost to current UFC fighter Elise Reed. You guys might recognize Elise Reed because she basically got dominated and finished in the first round when she made her debut against Sajara Eubanks. But she's going to be a much taller fighter here. She probably has a wrestling advantage. Comes from a, a little bit of a boxing background. 3-0 and as a boxer. She's decent in the clinch. She's got some deadly knees. But this is kind of a fight I don't, I don't feel great about. You know, Pulaski on the other side, not a ton of tape on her. She's going to be much shorter, five inches shorter. But she's going to be a little more thick. She's probably more powerful. But I'm really not that impressed with her. I think both girls like to move forward. So it's going to be interesting to see who controls the center here. I expect a close competitive fight. But I'm going to go with just Suda Vicious just because I think she could have the wrestling advantage. Like I said, I expect her to have the advantage in the clinch. And I just think she's been training at better camps with better opponents. So I'm like I said, it's not a confident play, but I think you can get slight plus money, plus 102 currently on FanDuel. Um, it's not going to be a bet for me because like I said, I don't have a ton of confidence in it, but we're going to go with the Canadian here. Shout out to Canada. They came through for those that were on Ann Hellinger last week. I was not, but we're going to go with Canada here in the women's flyweight division with Jasuda Vicious. So to recap, for the D-Gen parlay, we're, go we're gonna go with Nasradonov in the first fight. I expect him to be the much better minute winner here. If he can avoid being finished by Almeida, I think he gets the job done. In the bantamweight division, we're gonna go with the Mo Show, Mo Miller, the high-level wrestling, the powerful wrestling. I think he covers the price here and gets the job done. And then in the middleweight division, Albert Duryov going up against Kyle Bittenkurt. So last week, we had a bunch of favorites. I thought it was gonna be a favorite level heavy card last week it ended up not being it was a dog heavy card this week i think the reverse i think we're going to see a lot of dogs barking this week and it starts in the middleweight division with kyle bittencourt like i said it's going to be a high paced high variance fight both guys have durability issues both guys are capable of finishing i'm going to take a small stab at the plus 300 on bittencourt in that one up next in the heavyweight division lucas brzezeski going up against dylan potter i mentioned multiple times the concerns I have about Brzezeski here. I think Dylan Potter's more well-rounded, more technical striker, more experience as well. It's dog or pass. We're going with the dog and that one and Dylan Potter. Then in the welterweight division, Anhe Luis going up against Jack Della. Luis is a guy who I think we need to have on our radar. He's so, so powerful on the feet. And Jack Della just gets hit too much. This is another one. I think it's going to be high pace. It should be a fun fight. But I can't justify a favorite price that I'm on Jack Della. So we're going to go with Anhe Luis. Closing things out for the D-Gen Parlay in the women's flyweight division, Jasmine Jusa Devicious. Like I said, it's not a confident lean, but I think she has the wrestling advantage. I think she has the, the advantage in the clinch as well. Palestri's just... This is a low-level fight, but I think Jusa DeVicious just has her edged out almost really everywhere. She just doesn't really do anything that impresses me in terms of her skill set. And so I'm going to go with the fighter who I think is more well-rounded, who has the advantage in the clinch, possibly the wrestling as well, who's been training at a better camp as well. So, so we're getting a big number for the DGen Parlay this week. Look in the description below. I'm going to link link it to my website, fightnumbers.com. That's where I'm going to post my final plays along with the DGen Parlay, along with the numbers that we got. And then, of course, you can always follow me on Bet MMA, where everything's third-party tracked at John Kelly DFS. That's going to do it for me this week, guys. Do me a favor. If you enjoy the video, please hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button for your boy trying to grow my channel. I definitely appreciate all the support lately, and we'll see you guys next time. Good luck on Tuesday.